Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Union Church of Los Angeles, Combined English Language Sunday Morning Worship Service. We are so thankful that you joined us both here in the sanctuary and on Zoom. Those of you on Zoom at this time, please mute your devices. Thank you very much. Today we have Abby joining the team, and we're going to open our service with a medley on At the Cross. Good morning. Um, my name is Amy. I'll be chairing this morning, and I get the privilege of welcoming you all uh, to Union Church service here in uh, person and also on Zoom virtually. Um, there's so much going on, right, in this world, but um, just within uh, here personally, but also globally, and I feel like. Um, Jesus' words are so appropriate for all times, um, especially um, when it's difficult. Um, Jesus is our Prince of Peace, and this is what he said in John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. Let's pray. Dear Gracious Heavenly Father, we come together as a family of believers and visitors, and we are so thankful that you brought us here this morning. Thank you that you are our Prince of Peace, and God, that you are the one that give us hope. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice on the cross. Thank you for your death so that we may live. Thank you so much for this time together to gather, to worship, to pray, to light candles, to greet each other, and to hear your word from Pastor Reuben. We're so grateful for this gift of this time together now. We welcome your Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Amy. At this time, please stand if you are able as we lead you in our opening song, Shine, Jesus, Shine. Lord the light, Lord the light of your love is shining in the midst of the darkness shining. Jesus, light of the world, shine upon us, set us free by the truth you now bring us. Shine on me, shine on me, shine Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father 
Father's glory blaze, Spirit blaze, set our hearts on fire. Flow, river flow, flood the nations with grace and mercy. Send forth your word, Lord, and let there be light. Lord, I come to your awesome presence From the shadows into your radiance By the blood I may enter your brightness Search me, try me, consume all my darkness Shine on me, shine on me Shine, Jesus, shine this land with the Father's glory, blaze, Spirit, blaze, set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow, flood the nations with grace and mercy. Send forth your word, Lord, and let there be light. As we gaze, as we gaze on your kingly brightness, so our faces display your likeness, ever changing from glory to glory. Mirrored here, may our lives tell your story. Shine on me, shine on me. Shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory. Blaze, Spirit, blaze. Set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow. Flood the nations with grace and mercy. Send forth your word, Lord, and let there be light. Thank you. Please remain standing for our next song, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. All hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diatem and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diatem and crown him Lord of all. Ye chosen seed of Israel's race, we ransom from fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord of all. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord of all. Let every kindred, every tribe on this terrestrial ball to him all majesty ascribe and crown him lord of all to him all majesty ascribe and crown him lord of all Oh, that with yonder sacred throng we at his feet may fall. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. 
Lord of all. Yeah. You may be seated. Together we want to pray. And so I will read the one, and I will have you join me on all. Let's pray. Give peace in our time, O God, O, o good and gracious God. That peace which, as your son Jesus Christ told us, is a peace which the world cannot give. O leaders, grant, grant the wisdom to see the, to see the common humanity that makes us all your children, children and brothers, brothers and sisters and to one another. To those who have taken up arms in anger or revenge, or even in the cause of justice, grant the grace of com com conversion to the path of peaceful dialogue. To the innocent who live in the shadow of war and terror, be shelter and strength, their comfort and hope. Grant this through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Amy. At this time, please stand if you're able for our opening hymn, Just As I Am. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Just as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blot to thee whose blood can cleanse each spot, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Just as I am, thou wilt receive, wilt welcome, pardon, cleanse, relief, because thy promise I believe, O Lamb of God, I come, I come, just as children up and while they're coming up uh, we just want to incorporate our youth or um, to our service and so we have this portion of our service to light the candles and Judah today will be reading Soji has revolted so I'll be lighting <laughs> the candles this morning We light a light in the name of the Maker, who lit the world and breathes the breath of light for us. We, we light a light in the name of the Son, who saved the world and stretched out his hands to us. We light a light in the name of the Spirit, who heals the world and fills our, heart, our, our souls with yearning. We all say, we light three light lights in the name of the, the Trinity, Trinity of love. God above us, God beneath us, God beneath us. Giving the 
end, the everlasting one. All right, we're going to invite you all to sing this song with us this morning. This little light of mine, as we remember that God is the light that shines on each and every one of us. Stand to your feet if you're able this morning as we sing. In the key of C, not the key of G. <laughs> This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Oh, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine. Oh, I'm gonna let it shine everywhere I go. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Jesus gave it to me. Jesus gave it to me. I'm gonna let it shine. Oh, Jesus gave it to me. Yes, he did. I'm gonna let it shine. Jesus gave it to me. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Amen. All right, remain standing. Um, so we want to greet one another during this time of uh, passing of the peace as we extend it to others, and then you will receive the peace as well. So let's read this together. Christ is our peace, not an easy peace, not an insignificant peace, not a half-hearted peace, but may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with us now. The peace of the Lord be with you and also with you. Please get out of your seats and greet one another. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a quote for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come. They refused to come. Sent some more servants and said, tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened cattle have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest, says his servants, mistreated them and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burnt their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. So go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. He asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into a darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And we are invited, but few are chosen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Thank you so much, Sister May, for that wonderful reading. And thank you for everyone who is here 
worshiping with us this morning. Uh, thank you for braving the Cyclavia uh, obstacles. And uh, for those of you who are on Zoom, it's such a blessing to see you as well. If you would open your Bibles with me on page 803 in the Red Bibles. We're going to reread that passage a little bit because if you have never heard those words come out of Jesus' mouth, it's worth revisiting what exactly Jesus was saying in this passage of Scripture. I want to, I want to do a lot of prefacing with this, with this passage. The first preface is a very personal one. This is probably one of the hardest passages to preach out of as a minister of the gospel. Because Jesus is saying something that clearly defies or very much is, is out of step with perhaps the vision that we have of Jesus. Let's read it again. As we reread it again, I want you to understand the context of what Jesus is saying, why he's saying what he's saying. The context of, of, the, of this passage is Jesus' last week on earth. This is presumably Monday or Tuesday of the Passion Week, the last week of Jesus' life. We, we've read three parables that Jesus says upon entering Jerusalem. Throughout the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is saying, I am going to be crucified. I am going to fulfill the assignment that God the Father has for me, which is the redemption. We read about the Lamb of God just recently uh, in, in this last hymn. Jesus was the Lamb of God. He understood the assignment, and he knew that Jerusalem was ground zero. He knew that coming into that city was a death sentence. So did Jesus enter Jerusalem quietly, meekly, kind of behind the scenes? No. You know how Jesus entered Jerusalem on the last week of his life, knowing that he would be killed and crucified? He came on a donkey. And as he came into the city, the people gathered around, grabbed palm branches, and started to call him what? The king of kings. They called him the king of kings. They said, Hosanna. This is the one we've been waiting for. This is the one the prophet said would come. And you know what he did? He didn't kind of like, you know, tamper down. He marched right into the temple, and he saw that the church had been converted into a place of business. He didn't say politely and kindly to the priest and to the pastors and to the leaders, hey, do you guys want to have a meeting and rethink how we do church? No. He walked down here and he threw the tables over. He was not being politically correct. He was not being nuanced. He was saying the time for change is now. And I'm the guy you've been waiting for. Amen? So this is the context. Let's reread it. Jesus is not tiptoeing into Jerusalem. He's not being quiet about his assignment. And he says this as he's speaking to not just the average Judean or Jerusalem citizen. He's saying this to the priests, the Sadducees, the, the, the chief priests, the, 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 the metal metal, the shock collars, the OGs, amen? He's saying this. Once more, verse 1, chapter 22. Once more Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves or his servants to call those who had been inviting to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves or servants saying, tell them who have been invited, look, I prepared my dinner. My oxen, my fatted calves have been slaughtered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest, listen to this, the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. This is where it gets even more disturbing. <laughs> In this parable, verse 7 says this, the king was enraged. He sent his troops to destroy those murderers and burned their city. Let's pause right there. I want to call that Act 1 in this parable. Act 1, Jesus is culminating his part of his, uh, his, his, his discourse with the Pharisees in Jerusalem on the last week of his life. 
he overthrows, he overturns the tables, he, he disrupts in the previous chapter as we preached on a couple of weeks ago. Jesus goes so far that in the midst of the temple says to the priests, the prostitutes and the tax collectors are going to get into heaven before you. Jesus is going full throttle. Amen. <laughs> He's going, he's going ham, as the kids say, amen? He's going all out. He's leaving it all on the table. In this passage of scripture, I believe Jesus employs something of the absurd in trying to describe what the kingdom of God is like. For us to try to, to treat this passage of scripture as allegory would be a mistake. And again, I want to pull back a little bit and remind us of what the purpose of Jesus' teaching through parables. We've said it over and over as we've gone through the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus used parables to teach people more than sermons. Jesus used parables more than any other teaching format. Parables are not instructionals. Parables are not, um, are not Jesus' way of saying, now I want you to behave like this. Parables were ways that Jesus and the scripture used to provoke, provoke action and provoke reflection. Go with me, if you would, real briefly to, to 2 Kings chapter 12, 2 Samuel rather, chapter 12. It's on page 248. On page 248, we're going back to the Old Testament. And I want us to go to this passage because, again, the Bible has used parables often. And it used parables not to try to teach people how to act, but it tried to awaken their consciousness. How do you feel? How does this make you feel? And Jesus wanted to get a reaction from the, the leaders. He wanted to provoke them. So Jesus has given them this wild parable. The first time, one of the first times that we see parables used in all of the Bible is the prophet Nathan going to King David. In chapter 12, verses 1, we're going to read this. This is the first time we see, one of the first times that we see the Bible use parables in general. It says this, and again, the context is David sleeps with one of his soldiers' wives, gets her pregnant, wants to cover up his sin, so tells his generals, put him, Uriah, on the front lines. When he's on the front lines, pull back and let, let, them, let the enemy take him. Nathan receives a word from God that this has happened. And God says, Nathan, go and tell David this story. Tell him what this is. This is what it is, chapter 12, verse 1. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. And the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, there were two men. This is the parable. There were two men in a certain city. The one was rich, the other was poor. The rich man had very many flocks of her and herds. But the poor man had nothing but a little ewe lamb, which he had, which he had bought. He brought it up. He grew up. He grew it up. With him and his children, it, it used to eat at his meager fare and drink from his cup and lie in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there was a traveler to the rich, to the rich man, and he, was, and, he, and he was loath to make one of his own flock or herd to prepare the, 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 the wayfarer who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared that for the guests who had, had come to him. Then David, then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. He said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. He shall restore that lamb fourfold because of this thing and, and because he had no pity. David turns to, Nathan turns to David and says, you are that man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. And we can continue to go forward. That's the first time we see the Bible, one of the first times we see the Bible using parables. And it sets the, t the tone for why Jesus used these parables. Jesus used these parables because he was trying to not rebuke or insult or shame people. He was trying to get their consciousness to wake up. He was trying to get them to change their behavior. And there's a thing called, uh, um, help me Megan with this, it's cognitive dissonance. I don't know why you were supposed to help me, but you were supposed to help me. We talk about this all the time. My, my wife and I, we've been working with churches. We've been working, and I've been a pastor for 20 years now. 
one thing that I've understood being a pastor is that I can tell you what the Bible says. I can tell you to open your Bibles to page so-and-so and follow with me. I can give you statistics on what is happening. But you know what changes people's hearts? It's not statistics. It's stories. People hear the story of somebody that came back from Africa, like our sister Amy, and did a, a, a good work. People hear about stories of, of the work that we're doing on Skid Row, and, and, and somebody tells their, 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 their journey, and it changes something in you. You hear a story. It humanizes it, right? Jesus used parables because he was trying to appeal to these religious leaders at the 11th hour. Guys, please wake up. The Bible says that in chapter 22, Jesus says to them, the kingdom of God is like a wedding banquet. The kingdom of God is like a party. In first century Jewish culture, in first century Jew ancient Near East, one of the most important events of your life would be your wedding, would be a feast of this nature. Everybody would be invited. And in this story, Jesus says, the kingdom of God is like a party. The kingdom of God is is like not just the party imagine the most epic party that's what the kingdom of god is like so jesus says the first act is the invitations go out and who does it go out to first a-listers amen <laughs> the top tier bible says that the the king sends out the invitation and what does the bible say they made light of it in verse five but they made light of it chapter 22 verse 5 they made light of it and went on their way went to his farm went to their business it gets a little bizarre because it says not only did they rebuff it the the king sends a second a second wave of invitations and ups the ante a little bit he says check this out i haven't gotten any rsvps back but there's gonna be barbecue <laughs> fatted calf that we're gonna be throwing down we got the top chefs in the game are going to be there. The Bible says not only did they reject the second time, they killed the messengers. They killed the messengers. In this parable, the king does not uh, respond rationally. He responds with rage. Chap verse 7 says this, the king was enraged and went, killed the people, and burned down their city. This is where the story goes dark, okay? <laughs> so put on your, your spiritual thinking hat because at this stage of Jesus' ministry, he's not talking about the kingdom of God being like a, a, a shepherd who has a hundred sheep and one goes away or the kingdom of God being like a good Samaritan. This is calculus level spirituality. And Jesus is sitting with the chief priests, the Sadducees, the lawyers of the law, so he's saying, I'm going to go down the rabbit hole with you. I'm going to go down the rabbit hole with you. Follow me here. In the second act, verse 8 says this. Then he said to his slaves or his servants, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, to the main streets. One version says the highways and the byways. And invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. The slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found. Listen to what it says. Both good and what? And bad. Both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. This is gets a little bit more crazy, right? The second act of this is after Jesus in this, in this parable says that the king sends this wedding invitation. A-listers rebuff it sends out a second invitation, they still diss him, so the king burns down the city, kind of through a tantrum fit. This is why this story is very important not to see as allegory, because if we say this is how God reacts to those who reject him, God, that's not the God that we know, amen? This passage especially has been damaging towards and towards relationships between Christians and Jews because for some Christians, they have used this passage of scripture to justify the ransacking and the demonization of the Jewish community. So this is how I want to suggest we re-understand or re reinterpret this passage of scripture. In this, second, in this second wave, or this second act rather, the invitation goes out to everyone. The invitation gets passed down and it's a general 
open invite. And the Bible makes a very interesting comment in this passage of scripture. The invite goes to people who are worthy and people who are unworthy. It says the good and the bad. Again, Jesus is saying it's not a morality test. It's not a morality test. It's not a behavior modification system. This is something deeper. Here was where I want you to buckle up. If you guys have ever been to Magic Mountain, and if you guys have ever been to a, a, a roller coaster, there's always that last click, right? Where you're like, click, 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 click. This is the last click, okay? And then it drops. If you thought that the ascent was pretty bad, okay, Jesus is kind of getting a little weird on me here. Jesus sounds a little irrational. Jesus sounds a little bit like he's... Uh, He's a little bit losing it here. I think that that's appropriate in terms of saying, build the context. Jesus was on the last week of his life. He had healed. He had preached. He had fed the multitudes. And still the religious leaders were saying, who do you think you are? And Jesus says, okay, all right. You want to know? Here is what it is. Listen to where this is the last click here. Verses Verses 10 through 14 says this. Or verse 11, rather. This is the last, this is the last thing that really take, tips this over the edge. But when the king came to see the guests, this is after both good and bad had been brought into the banquet, he noticed a man there that was not wearing a wedding robe. Pretty reasonable. He didn't get an invitation until the last hour. The servants go out, bring him in. Didn't, wasn't wearing the wedding robe. Verse 12. And the king said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him, hand and foot, and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then Jesus culminates this parable, this, this wild parable, with the phrase, For many are invited, many are called, but few are chosen. Okay. Turn to your neighbor and, said, and say, say what? <laughs> Anybody else getting that vibe? Anybody else getting that vibe from Jesus this morning? Okay, okay, how, how, do, we, how do we reconcile this? All right, here's my, here's my, here's my good news. You know, the, the Bible uses one term to describe the Gospels. We have four Gospel books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And that word Gospel simply means good news. So the task that we have whenever we approach the Gospels is we ask ourselves, where is the good news in this? Here's the good news. The last verse, verse 14, is Jesus says this to tie in this parable. Many are called, few are chosen. Many are invited, few are chosen. The context of this parable is Jesus saying the kingdom of God is like a party. The kingdom of God is like a wedding. The kingdom of God is like a feast. In fact, Jesus ten times gives stories in which he's describing the kingdom of God to people. And you know what way Jesus describes more often than any other way to describe what the kingdom of God is like? A party, a feast, a wedding. Jesus is saying, I have not come to bring a religious institution I have not come to bring a new doctrine, a new set of laws. I've come to bring a party. The first miracle that Jesus does is in the context of a wedding. He turns water into wine, and the Bible says the master of ceremony was dumbfounded. Who brought this wine? This, this is amazing. We would never use this at the end of the party. Jesus is saying, I have come to bring joy and joy in abundance. I've come to bring life and life in abundance. Amen? Your spiritual life, your physical life, your emotional life, your social life, it's supposed to be animated and vibrated by the presence of God in your life. This is what it means to be a Christian. When you become a follower of Christ, you, not be, you don't become more rigid, more dogmatic, more judgmental. When you become a Christian, you, your life comes alive. You, your life comes alive. Jesus is saying to the religious leaders on the last week of his life, don't you understand? I want to throw a party. And everyone is invited. And in the last scene of this parable, Jesus, I'm going to use my Rubenomics here. This is my Ruben interpretation. Some Yahoo that gets pulled off of the street <laughs> gets thrown into hell because he wasn't wearing 
wedding attire. It's a little weird. Here's what I think Jesus is saying. There's two types of sin that we can commit. There's two types of sin. Some of you might be saying, Pastor, I know a lot more than two types of sins. <laughs> there's a lot more than two. Okay. There's sins of commission and there's sins of, sins of omission. Those are the categories that I, I, I try to say. Those are the two main categories. Sins of commission are all those things, bad things or, or, or un, un, uh, um, unethical things that we do, unhealthy things. Those are sins of commission. And then those are sin, there are sins of omission. The Bible says knowing to do the right thing and not doing it is a sin. If you can help your brother, if you can help your sister, and if you don't do that, that's wrong. That's what the scripture says. There's sins of commission and sins of omission. In this passage of scripture, I think Jesus is rebuking those who openly rejected Jesus and those like this riffraff that got pulled in at the end and didn't realize it's a party. Act accordingly. It's not a free-for-all. It's a party. Get with the program. I want to leave you with this encouragement. Amen? Your spiritual life, your life as a Christian, and I hope that your experience of being a part of this church, Union Church, I hope that it's characterized by our understanding that this is a place of healing, restoration, and a place of joy. We do not have it all figured out. Can somebody say amen? Amen. We do not have it all figured out. At least I can say for myself, as a pastor, having served, as a missionary, church planner, all these things, I got a long way to go. But I have understood this foundational aspect of my relationship with God and my relationship with the community of Christ. It is a party. (laughs) It's a party. Above everything else, what we're doing here today is we're reminding ourselves That God has not called us to live a life of penance, a life of being ashamed of our past, a life of we're trying to grovel at God's feet, or we're trying to stand on our on our high on our on our high horse. We're trying to stand on our soapbox. No, 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 no. Jesus is saying on the last week of his life, as he's standing in the in the temple, guys, this is a joy. Life, life is a gift. Life is a gift. And the king of kings and the Lord of lords went right into the seat of power and said, guys, get with the program. Get with the program. It's a party. It's a party. It's a feast. Amen? I'm not sure what your association with church is. For some people, their association with Christianity or their association with God or their association with with religion as a whole can be a little bit complicated right we can for many people the church is 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 kind of a a a complicated thing i pray this morning that you remember that even in this very unorthodox parable that jesus gives his disciples and gives the religious leaders of his time he is trying to make one thing crystal clear everybody gets an invite to the get down Everybody gets invited to the barbecue. Everybody. Good and bad. But here's one thing you can't do. You got to show up and you got to dance. Amen? (laughs) You got to dance. I think the guy that got that that got rebuked for not wearing the wedding robe, I think he showed up and he's like, free food, awesome. (laughs) And the king is like, yo, it's my son's wedding. You better get up and dance. We just had a wedding for our sister uh, Alicia. Uh, Kitamura now, her, she, uh, one of our, our leaders, right down, to, down across the way here at JACCC. I was actually at the table with Lori and, and the Taguchis. And um, when my wife hears dance music going, she likes to cut the rug, amen? Don't nobody want to see their pastor trying to get out there and boogie, amen? <laughs> Sister Megan, she likes to dance. She, she, was, I know, she, she got the moves. She got the wedding moves, amen? And One thing I appreciate so much about going to any wedding or any feast with my wife, when that dance floor is open, when the DJ is, she's going to be the first one on the floor. Why? Because it's a wedding. And what do you do at a wedding? You celebrate. You dance. Jesus is saying, here's the deal, (laughs) y'all. I'll let anybody in, good and bad. A-listers 
and dropouts. You get in. But here's the catch, y'all. When that music starts bumping, elbows up, side to side, let's go. It's a party. It's a feast. Your spiritual life, it's not a chore. It's not some checkbox that you put on your week. I went to church, now I'm good. It's a party. Dance. Get with the program. Many are called, few are chosen. Let's pray. God, you are the most epic DJ in the cosmos. Lord, I pray that each and every one of us, God, would understand, God, that your heart for your creation, your heart for your people across the globe, God, our sisters and brothers in Israel and Palestine, our sisters and brothers, God, here in Los Angeles, God, those experiencing homelessness or those in penthouses, God, Lord, you invite everybody into this feast. God, we ask that we as your people would be those who get the message and act accordingly. God, you've invited us to this banquet. And it's about a party, God. It's not about changing people to think how we think. It's about celebrating the feast of your son, our Lord Jesus Christ. God, help us to be those who are the first ones on the dance floor. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Ruben. Once again, please take a moment during the interlude to silently reflect on Pastor Ruben's message today. Amen. Thank you, Brother Dan, for that awesome uh, piece. We want to thank you again for all of your support and generosity over the years, over this past uh, few months. We've been so blessed to be able to use the gifts that you all provide to this church to help serve our community as best as possible. This month is our stewardship month, and in a few uh, days you may be receiving a letter which just reminds folks that on October 29th we have our Commitment Sunday service. October 29th is uh, also a combined service, and it's a time when we come together and we simply bring to God our gifts. Uh, during the whole fall season, it's a time for us to reflect on the abundance that God has brought into our life. Uh, there's a wonderful opportunities for us to remember all the ways in which God has provided. And when we take up our tithes and our offerings, we really do so in a spirit of, of gratitude. And we thank you again for everything that you all do. And ask you to consider praying about partnering with us this next coming year. We have the Commitment Sunday service, and you can make a commitment for the support for this coming year. Uh, we have offering envelopes in your pews there if you would like to give in person today. And we also have ways to give online. They have, there's a, there's a QR code that you can scan with your phone to give. I want to invite the ushers to come forward, and as they do, we want to invite Brother Dan to play uh, something that would help us to remember uh, God's goodness and God's faithfulness into our lives. Amen.
want to invite you to stand on your feet if you're able to at this time as we sing this doxology together in gratitude for everything that God has brought into our, ha into our hands, into our homes. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise on all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. God, I thank you for each and every person in this place, God. Lord, I pray that you would bless them, God. Overflow their cups, God, financially, God, emotionally, spiritually, socially, God. Lord, may there be an, an attitude and a spirit of abundance in our midst, God. We thank you for all that you bring into our hands. And God, we graciously and thankfully give back, God, just a portion of all you've get, given to us. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated, and I want to invite our sister Amy, who's going to be giving some announcements and letting us know what's happening in the life of the church. Okay, so um, regularly on Saturday, there's a Zoom um, gathering to pray uh, Saturday morning from 8 to 8.30, um, and that could, you can find the link to that on our website. But also, if you get our newsletter um, every week, if you sign up to get our newsletter, there's a link from that newsletter every week as well. On Sunday mornings, Pastor Yabuki, Ken Yabuki has a 9 o'clock Bible study. Uh, every morning on Sundays, and that's also on Zoom. Not next week, but the week after will be our combined service. Very important because it starts your the church service uh, with the English and Nichigo will meet at 10 o'clock. So please make a note of that. So 10 o'clock, not next week, but the week after, and then following the service will be the congregational meeting. And then after the congregational meeting, we're going to party. We really are, just like Pastor said. So Oktoberfest, um, we'll have a lunch provided. But if you'd like to sign up to bring a salty or sweet treat, the board is in the hallway. Uh, we're going to have a great time. This is in lieu, I guess, of uh, Thanksgiving gathering maybe. So uh, it's our fall October festival. Please join us. Okay, and then on November 4th is our uh, movie night, and the movie is Million here at the church from 4 to 7. Uh, bring comfy clothes and watch a uh, movie together night. Oh, and Vessi, do you want to talk more about that? <laughs> there will be free popcorn. <laughs> and bring your own treats to share, perhaps, uh, if you like to do that as well. And then uh, I just learned about this Harvest concert, or yeah, Harvest concert. Uh, Miyuki uh, from the Nichigo side is um, coordinating this, but it's pretty cool. Um, there's going to be a famous um, taiko drummer coming, and honestly, I love taiko. I wish I could be here. I don't know if I can. I hope I'm able to be here. But um, it's a, a Japanese drum player named Takumi Kato. Uh, that will be doing taiko and some other people with him. Um, and then also our Dan, right, will also be performing at this event. So this is uh, 12th of November from 2 o'clock. And there's a suggested donation of $5. Anything else?
So Union Church is hosting him, and he's making a tour around the United States. I hope that you all could come that night and support him and all the fun that's going to happen around here. And then I'll invite Pastor Ruben for the benediction. So in the next couple of weeks, we have Oktoberfest on the 29th. That's a Sunday. Movie night on the 4th, which is a Saturday. And then Taiko Drums uh, Cultural uh, Celebration on the 12th. That just uh, is a reminder that there's good stuff happening. There's opportunities for us to come together, celebrate, break bread together, and uh, thank God for all that God has been doing in our lives throughout this year. So I want, in that spirit, I want to invite you to stand to your feet and join me for this closing benediction. God, we thank you that you are a God that invites us not into a dreadful existence. Lord, you're not a God that just wants to coerce us into compliance. You're a God that invites us to put our dancing shoes on and get with the program. Lord, I, I pray that, Lord, if there are any things in our life that are distorting our spirituality into being anything other than a, a party, a feast, God, I pray that today you would remind us that you're a God of joy, you're a God of love, you're a God of peace, God. And Lord, we pray that as people of God, we would be the first ones on the dance floor. We ask that as we go forth from this place, God, we would resonate, we would resonate deeply because there are many, many ways in which we can see the world through the lens of sorrow and the lens of brokenness and the, the lens of pain. God, all those things are very present. But God, as people of faith, as people of God, we live on the vibration and the frequency of your love. Lord, may we go forth to be your hands and feet. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Reuben. Please remain standing and join in our closing song as our special guest artist, Abby, leads us in singing, They'll Know We Are Christians. Thank you. Amen, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Have a great week, and we'll see you next week.